Hopefully, since you stumbled across this podcast, you understand that I might be talking about topics that are a little bit sensitive for some people and can be a little bit triggering at times for other people. So if you are one of those people that have a tendency to feel that way, please keep that in mind while listening to this podcast. Hi everybody, welcome to the Sinister Story Hour. Tonight we have kind of a doozy for you of a story. So, a <laughs> doozy. Do you like that word? Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> Apparently, kids don't say doozies anymore. Oh. So, what's a doozy in your... I don't know, it's just a good thing, I guess, but no one says that. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a lost art. It's a lost art of vocabulary. So, um, if you hear something in the background, the bunnies, they are going nuts today. We have dogs barking, we have chickens clucking, and we have bunnies going nuts. It snowed a lot, and for some reason, the animals are going crazy today. Um, so, I think we have the dogs calmed down and the chickens maybe quieted down a little bit, but the bunnies, they're not there yet. So, uh, we have a guest, so thank you for showing up. Glad to be back. Yeah, thank you. I know it's hard to schedule around basketball, so now that basketball season is a little bit over, so thank you for coming back, and well, congratulations on second in the state. That's thank a big you. deal. Yep. Yeah, congratulations. That was awesome. So, uh, in between basketball seasons, I guess, I should say, <laughs> for like a couple days, huh? Yep. <laughs> All right, so we will get started on our story for tonight. So we're going to talk about the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Have you heard much about this one? A bit. A bit, yeah. So it's it's a good one, but it's a little bit gruesome. So again, if you're not into gruesome, this is probably not your jam. So we'll get into it here. So first, I'm going to set the scene for you. We're in 1935. So we're at the tail end of the Great Depression. We're coming out of the Great Depression. Financially, we're in hard times a little bit still, but we're starting to come out of the financial hard times, I guess. Um, a lot of people are still having some some rough financial situations happening, though. So we're in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're in an area called the Kingsbury Run. And it's a huge creek bed. People are grouping up into this area and basically finding any place to live that they possibly can. So um, a lot of people are homeless and there are a lot of prostitutes, a lot of things happening. So um, I think it's pretty normal during hard financial times that you start getting creative about how to make money, right? Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, prostitution is one of those things that people can turn to. Um, there were also, there was an area that was in this area, they called it the Roaring Third. So just from that name, seems like a pretty poppin' place, right? Um, so it's known for its bars, gambling dens, and brothels. So it's quite the activity happening in this area. It's also known as the Hobo Jungle because there are a lot of homeless people in the area. So... Uh, they described the class of people that were in this area as the working poor. They really didn't have a place to go other than this area that they had kind of created themselves. So they live in what's called like this little shanty town that they've created. And I looked up what a shanty town actually means because I've heard of it before, but I just didn't really, I guess, pay too much attention to what it actually was. So it's kind of an area where people will just go set up whatever kind of residence they can on land that's not theirs. So they're just basically squatters on the land. So they go to this Kingsbury Run area and they basically make a home out of whatever they can find. So they've got mud, trash, whatever they can find to make houses out of. And the pictures of that are pretty sad. I mean, it's it's not a, an ideal situation at all. So, um, again, you, you've not got your neighborhood cul-de-sac, your ideal situation happening already here, right? So, kind of a sad time for people, I would say. But the areas, not only are they just pretty 
nasty, but they don't have adequate sanitation. They're pretty filthy. They don't have a safe water supply. They don't have heat, electricity, running water, anything happening like that. Um, I also, I would dare to say that there's quite a bit of crime happening mm. in the area too. Because what do you get when you have people without money and hard times and desperation? Right. Prostitutes, brothels, gambling leads to no bueno, right? Um, so during this time, it just wasn't really unlikely that a person was going to hop a freight train and go to different parts of the country in search of maybe new opportunities where, where they could find a job or some money. So um, also that leads to a lot of transients that can't be quickly identified because you don't know who's coming or going mm -hmm. daily. Um, so a lot of people um, are in this area, transients that don't normally live there. It's not like you set up a normal residence and stay there forever. Um, so, unfortunately, these are the kind of people that make the ideal victim because they aren't, I, like, really readily identified, like I said. And a lot of the time, their families aren't in constant contact, especially in 1935 when they're not able to just text their family members and say, hey, where are you? Are you doing okay? Hmm. Um, these are not people that are in regular contact with their families or friends or anybody that might miss them if they're not there anymore. So... They, some of them didn't go noticed for months, some of them up to like maybe a year. So not a real ideal situation here. So we will get into what happens. So one day we've got two kids, ages 12 and 16, and they're having a race down the hill. And this hill happens to be called Jackass Hill. So that's where we're going to find our first victims is on jackass hill so we have a 12 year old a 16 year old they're racing down to get their ball and they james wagner the 16 year old makes it down the hill first so not only does he get his ball at the end of the hill but he finds a human corpse so um when he finds the body though it's without a head so at the same time there are also two brothers at the top of the hill and they're looking down, they're watching this happen and they can see the brothers, they see the body and they go off and get help. The two brothers that find the body at the bottom of the hill are two friends, I should say. So we've got a set of brothers and a set of friends. They both go off and try to get help. So when the police hear about this, they think that they've got the same body that they're dealing with. And it turns out that they actually have two victims at the bottom of Jackass Hill. So we got a double whammy. That's not good. Um, so two decapitated corpses are at the bottom of the hill. And they find the first victim's head actually buried in the ground 20 feet away. Hmm. Um, he is later identified. We'll go over him, his identification a little bit in just a minute. But... Um, the second person, uh, we'll talk more about him, but he was never identified. So they both were castrated. And one thing that was really interesting to note, keep in mind, they had both been castrated, but no blood was appearing anywhere. So um, they'd been drained of all of their blood. So make a mental note. We'll come back to that. And their skin was reddish and kind of a leathery texture to it. So they figured they had been maybe um, that somebody had used a chemical on their body to try to disintegrate their skin faster. And what it did was actually the opposite. They had actually preserved their bodies for longer. So um, about 70 feet away, they find the head of the second corpse. And they finally do locate their genitals along with some items of clothing. And the clothing is covered in blood. So they also find a torch, pieces of rope, and a bucket that's containing a mixture of car oil and blood. And that's never explained of why that was there. And so even one more disturbing piece to that, which I don't know that you get more disturbing than this already, but um, 
is that the decapitations were actually the cause of death. So they weren't killed and then decapitated. They were actually decapitated in order to kill them. Dang, that's brutal. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, so they uh, also determined that the decapitations are done with one single stroke. So they actually removed their heads with one, one fatal cut. Um, and I can't even imagine decapitating somebody with one cut. So the force that that would take is is insane. So, so that is just the start of what we're going to talk about and the start of the killer that becomes known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. So again, I said they identified the first guy, Edward Andra- Andrassy, and his head had been severed by a knife. So that is one sharp knife and probably a big one to take off a head. Um, So the knife had been used obviously with a great amount of force, but also was extremely precise. And the coroner notices that the heart is virtually bloodless at this point. So where did that happen? Where did, that's one thing that came up to me. I mean, where did the person, the killer have the space to do this? If he was living in a shanty town, in Kingsbury Run, he obviously doesn't have the space probably to go and drain this body of its blood and do this basically a makeshift surgery on this guy. So mm. uh, I don't know. It's it's an odd thing. So number two is, like I said, never identified. We call him John Doe number one. And again, these people that I'm talking about, I'm talking about in the order that they were discovered. I'm not talking about in the order that they were actually killed because some of them were killed and not discovered for months and up to a year, like I said later. So uh, number three, so we got a freezing cold morning, January, a woman walks into a meat market and she tells the butcher Charles Page that there are two hams wrapped in newspaper and placed in, placed in baskets nearby, um, behind a nearby building. So Page is thinking that maybe somebody stole some hams from his butcher shop. So he goes to take a look and he soon discovers that the baskets are not full of hams. It's way worse than that. So in the basket, they find a lower torso, a right arm, a right hand, and two thighs. And then they start searching the area and they don't find any other parts at all. So they do have fingerprints from the hand that's found and they lead that back and identify her as Flo Polio. And she is said to be a heavy drinking waitress who is also a part-time prostitute. Hmm. So uh, number four is never identified. He's known as the tattooed man. So um, that's all we really know about him is that he did have six tattoos. One of them was an anchor. And so they thought maybe he was a, like an ex-military type Navy soldier or something, but that didn't lead to anything either. So um, they did recover his body and all six tattoos were identified there, but that didn't help them in, in the actual identification of who he was. And, um, he was actually determined to be decap- decapitated while he was still alive. So that's brutal. That is brutal. So John Doe number three is our fifth person that's found. Uh, they don't know much about this man except for he was dismembered while still alive as well. So we've got kind of the same MO happening. The killer likes to dismember these people, decapitate them while they're still alive. Um, so I'm not really sure where this was happening and how people weren't catching on to this by now of who this could be or what's going on. But um, nobody seems to be getting any clues by now. So so number six is John Doe number four. And only half of the torso is ever found. So uh, nothing remains below the hips. So pretty gross. And they never find the